ABC Wednesdays. Y'all can play all day. We want books. We want paper towels in the classroom. Bet you want raises, too. I'm Honey. still waiting on the paper towels. Abbott Elementary returns with the new season. We asked the district for more after-school programs. They gave us $50 for class pets instead. Critics cheer. Abbott Elementary continues to be one of the funniest and most beloved shows on TV. What y'all doing out there? Taking bribes. Proud of y'all. Abbott Elementary, Wednesdays, 930, 830 Central on ABC and stream on Hulu. Being a marketer is no sweat. You just have to manage dozens of channels, launch hundreds of campaigns, score thousands of leads, and... Okay, fine. It's a lot of sweat. Unless you have HubSpot's AI-powered marketing tools to help you do all that and more. Get started at HubSpot.com slash marketers. Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. That's what you'll feel with Bolin Branch's best-selling signature sheets in 100% organic cotton. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bolin Branch sheets get softer with every wash. Start getting your best night's sleep in sheets that get softer and softer for years to come. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee, plus for a limited time, get 20% off your first order at BolinBranch.com. code SPAN. Exclusions apply. See site for details. Hello there, folks, and thank you for listening to the show. I'm Joanna. I'm Nate, and we are Stranger Than, a podcast discussing unsolved mysteries, weird occurrences, misunderstood phenomena, and creepy happenings. As always, the Stranger Than podcast logo art is brought to you by Cthulhu Art. The link is in the show notes. So did you notice how like upbeat I was when I, I said my name today? Is it from the improv? Did they just put you in a great mood? <laughs> Yes, watching uh, a required improv class for my employer uh, to learn how to be uh, more respectful to others is, yeah. The best. It was the best. Great actors. I am just saying that I think for today's topic, trying to keep upbeat is important because it's pretty fucking gruesome. Yep, we're going into a true crime episode, I suppose. Yeah, been a while. It's been a little while. Today we're covering the Ketty Cabin Murders, which was a quadruple murder that occurred in 1981. In Ketty, California. Which is in Northern California, the Where eastern the girls part. Where warm, yeah. I don't know how warm. I mean, Northern California is not bad, but... It's the lyrics to a song. Oh. Yeah. The girls are warm in Northern California? Yeah. <laughs> huh. It's Keep On Rocking Me. Oh, by uh, Steve Miller? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yes. Yes. Can you hear it now? Yeah. No, I, I yeah. I'm Can just, you hear the phrase in your head I now? just, uh, dis- I disapprove. You disapprove of Steve Miller? No, just, you know, a little. Just a little. Okay, well, whatever. Anyways, I was actually pretty close to Ketty on my vacation that I was just on. Yeah. I ended up being probably, like, less than two hours away from it. I was a little more central. Like, Ketty is pretty east. Yeah. It's up and east in California, northeastern California. Were you just up and... Were you on I-5 or were you... Yeah, I was on I-5. I was coming because I stayed in Redding. And that was the night that I stayed with, like, no fucking sleep because... We were possibly going to get evacuated from our hotel because of the fire. Oh, right, because the the fire, fire. yeah. Because we literally drove into a fucking inferno. Like, I drove for hours from the Redwood National Parks, which is, like, way on the other side of, Cal- like, the northwest coast yep, yep. of California. Right around They're- Arcata. Yeah. Anyways, I drive on this insanely twisty, awful, dark highway leaving Redwoods to get to Redding. It was, like, a three-and-a-half-hour drive on a twisty, dark road. For fucking three and a half hours. Yeah. Like, literally. Like, I-5 was, like, kind of, like, right at the end. Yeah, Like, yeah. oh, now you get to go 14 miles on I-5, and you're like, yay! Well, finally, civilization, I kind was, of. It was so fucking awful. And then we get on, and we get off, and it was like, you could smell the smoke, and the moon started turning red, just like when we had all that smoke in the air. Oh, yeah. So, and you could smell it through the car that there was, like, smoke in the air. And I then hate we, that drive into town like oh yeah we're finally here to our hotel and you look and like look over and it's like 
what the fuck is that? Like, because there's like a giant fucking inferno that is like burning on the hillside that you can plainly see the sky is lit up red. Fire. It's like, oh, look, that's a fucking fire. Great. That's consuming like part of the town already. That's the worst. That was the worst. That was kind of like, well, fuck. I didn't go to Yosemite, which, you know, like we discussed before, that was kind of like, that was, what did you call it? Like a soft letdown or? I don't remember. He said something like that, but, um, but yeah. I mean, bummed, but the Ferguson fire kept us from going there. And then the one that I drove into was the car fire, C-A-R-R. All the fires Which was started are so by awful. a car, though, oddly enough. Huh. Is that irony or coincidence? I have no idea. I don't, know how, I don't know how they name fires. Like, why is this, why is the one in Yosemite, like, the Ferguson fire? Is it Ferguson County? Maybe. Probably. Maybe it's the county, maybe it's Car County. I don't know. But it was a car that, like, a car, like, had a flat tire, and they had a tow truck for it, and... The rims like scraped on the road. Oh, and as, sparked a fire. And it sparked, and that literally sparked one wow. of like the worst fires in California history right now. Oh, man. man, it's just got to be awful. Every single year for them, it's always on fire. Oh my and... god, because it gets it's so fucking dry. Yeah, yeah. It's it... harder for things to catch on fire out here. Even you know, even, even in the summertime, you never see forest fires out here. Rarely, yeah. <laughs> Here's my awesome segue back to get on topic. <laughs> pretty foresty there in the Ketty Resort, which was pretty much not a resort at no, that point. No, no, not not at that point. No, it's. Do you know when it opened? I think it was like 1910 or something. It was when there was still people doing like mining and um, logging, and so that boomed, and that's what brought the town up, and a railroad as well. Mm-hmm. And it pretty much at this point was well on the downfall. I believe at this time there was right around a hundred. It wasn't people. actually like a resort period at that no, point. No, it, it was like mo- like most of the cabins were being rented out by low income families on a long term basis. Yeah, just like the Sharp family. Yep. And just like their neighbors, most of their neighbors were, it's not like people were there on vacation. No, it was no. called like the Ketty. It was a cabin at a resort, but it was like people just like live there now. People were there because that's the last place they had to go, basically. And I don't even think there was like 100 people in the town. I heard it was like 66 fucking people. That was from the 2010 census. Oh, okay. So I believe at I this point. I knew you'd have all the correct facts. <laughs> Like, I'm just going to be like, oh, I think this is something. And they're like, and you're just going to be like, oh, let me look on my fucking notes and tell you like the exact date. Yes. Yes. Uh, but I believe there was right around 100 at the time. That's not a lot of fucking people. That's though. not a lot of people. So um, not at all. At around 7 a.m. on April 12th, 1981, Sheila Sharp, a 14 year old, returns to the cabin she lives in with her family. She'd stayed at her neighbor's house, the Seabolts, the night before. Right. Cabin 28, the Sharps cabin, was lived in by Sue, who is uh, 36, John, who's 15, Sheila, 14, Tina, 12, Rick, 10, and Greg, 5. Five kids. Five fucking kids. From 15 to 5 years old. That's a lot of kids. That is a lot of kids. That's like two more kids than I have, and I feel like I have like... 17 at times no i'm sure she felt like she had two or three times of that yes. with all those kids and she was a single mother because she yep. had left her they lived in quincy which was not very far from ketty um her her husband that she had left they they lived in connecticut together oh, did and they? so she'd moved across the country to leave his ass who mm-hmm. was allegedly abusive he was in uh, the navy i believe right and she was living off almost nothing 250 bucks a month some food stamps and then uh, she got some cash for going to school yeah but she had been living in quincy prior to moving to yes Kenny, yes she'd only been there like like since like it was like november or something and then she's killed like the following april yes they, five they, months. they were just there like four or five like five or six months or something they kind of bumped around across the country mm-hmm. visiting her friends as they left uh, the the total dick who was, yes yeah and um eventually yeah landed in 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 um Ketty. 
It la- you land in Ketty. Like, how does that fucking happen in your life? Her brother lived oh, around there, right, and so right. she wanted to be close. Well, she, I think he was the only family or mm-hmm. one of the only pieces of uh, bits of family around, and so he, you know, she wanted to be near him. And so he also probably, like, there. it's kind of a nice area, you know, lots of woods. There's not a lot of outdoor stuff, so it's, you know, the country. It's nice. Yeah, supposedly. Yeah. But not so much. Well, Sheila walked into her living room that morning and found her mother, her brother, and her brother's friend, Dana Wingate, 17, bound with tape and wire on the floor, presumably dead. She yeah. So she heads back to the cabin she was just at and, you know— Freaking out. Right. And she talks to Zonita Seabolt, which was the the mother. She told her what she found. Mm -hmm. So Zonita takes Sheila to the landlord's cabin, and they call the cops. Meanwhile, her eldest son, James, Jamie, went around the outside of the cabin and knocked on the windows. And the boys were, he knocked on the the kids' windows, because... And that's when they discovered the boys are all safe and sound. Alive and unharmed. Uh, He pulls the two sharps out, so the 10-year-old Rick and the 5-year-old Greg out the window... And then they also had a friend over whose name was Justin Eason, who was 12 years old. And he, his parents also lived in Ketty in the resort, in the resort with the air quotes going on here. Cabin number 26. Yes. And they were Marilyn and Marty Smart. And Martin, Marty Smart, old Martin Smart, was his stepfather. Mm-hmm. He had been living with his real, real father in Montana before he moved there. We'll talk a little bit about Justin later. Right. He's got a, a wild story. Yeah, it is. So I'm imagining they just pulled these kids out the window because they didn't want them to see the gruesome, bloody fucking scene. Right. I'm sure it's all about like, oh, let's keep the kids calm. You know, you're, you, I mean, the five year, a fucking five year old. Seriously. A seriously. That's like, not. I can't even imagine like no. what that would be like Awful. for my kids to have to experience. And no kid should have to experience no, that. No. Unfortunately, so too many kids like, do. You know, like, hey, come out the window so you don't like walk through the fucking murder scene and Try not, not only, to traumatize like, you for the rest of your life. God. Oh, my God. It's like, no, it's OK. We'll tell you what's going on. Just come out of the window. Just mm-hmm. let me get you out of the house first. And then we'll tell you the most awful fucking news of your life. Yeah. Uh, oh. Jamie later admitted to going to through the back door to check on the uh, the victims to see if anyone was alive. He didn't find anyone alive. Tina was not present at the scene. The night before, she had been at the Seabolts watching TV. She went home at about 9.30, an hour and a half after Sheila had come over. So she was gone. She was She was not there. She was not, but she was dead, but nobody knows this at this juncture. No, the murders were gruesome, violent. <laughs> it was really... <laughs> Sorry. You just you just sounded really serious there. <laughs> well, they were gruesome and violent. It was pretty fucked up. I really I mean... loved your, your intonation there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank the you. The were gruesome, violent, just despicable. It is despicable. It is despicable. Sue's body 100%. was found laying on her side, stripped from the waist down near the couch. Her panties had been stuffed in her mouth, and then her mouth taped over. Yep, she had a blue bandana also jammed in her mouth, so she had a bunch of shit jammed in her mouth, and they taped her fucking mouth shut. Her throat had been cut. She had several stab wounds in her chest, and a wound matching the butt end of a Daisy 880 BB gun on the side of her head. But they never found the BB gun. They have yet to recover a BB gun. She'd been covered by a yellow blanket. John had his throat cut. Dana had several head injuries and had been strangled by hand. Mm -hmm. All three had been beaten on the head with hammers and then bound with medical tape and extension cords. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ. They believe the assailants brought the medical tape. You've hit your head on something, right? Yeah, I mean, being hit in the head with a fucking hammer. When I was a kid... Me and my cousin were fucking around, mm-hmm. and he had a golf club, and he swung back to hit like a rock or something, and I happened to be there and conked oh, me on the head. Shit. And that hurt like a son of a bitch, and you feel it, because your skull is pretty solid, so you like feel uh. it through every bone in your body. You feel it from your toes to your teeth. It's crazy. I can't imagine being smacked so hard. That you, I mean, until you die with Basically a hammer. Basically with a fucking hammer. With a claw hammer. Well, also you know, like getting a, fucking like strangled and stabbed and yeah 
that wouldn't be great either. Oh my god! I mean, just what a horrible, violent way to kill three fucking four fucking people actually four. People. Right, that's terrible. It is. It is just unimaginably. It it is just unimaginably awful. Yes. Uh, according to investigators, there was a significant amount of blood in the living room. There was also some blood in Tina's room. There's blood on the fucking ceilings, too. It was like a fucking nightmare walking in there. The location of the pools of blood and splatter patterns suggests that the bodies spatter. were staged after the I attack. It's spatter, not splatter. I mean, really, both will work. Regardless. I'm just saying. It doesn't matter what it is. <laughs> it was everywhere. And because of it, it was fucking everywhere. They, they, they thought that the bodies got tossed where they were. After all the violence that occurred, there is blood on the bottom of of Sue's foot, indicating that she had She'd stood. walked through blood or stood in it. Still no Tina body. In fact, it's alleged that the first cop to arrive to the scene was told by Justin Eason that Tina was missing, but was ignored. Apparently, it took hours for authorities to realize the girl was missing. Right. It's like ev- suddenly everyone was like, oh, wait a second. Aren't like, we missing one? One, two, three, four. Holy shit. Right. They found a bloody footprint in the yard, two kitchen knives, and a hammer. One of the knives was bent at like a 25 degree angle. It had been used so vigorously. Well, yeah, you got your breastplate and your ribs. I imagine if you stab somebody enough times in them, it's going to, you're just going to wonk, it's going to break your knife. Probably. Not even with a lot of effort. It was probably like a cheap knife. Who knows? Right. Nevertheless. Nevertheless, yeah. Uh, they believe a second hammer was also involved in the crime, though they only found the one at the scene. At the time. Yes. And in 2016, some guy was using a metal detector. Someone like lost a wedding ring or some shit. Mm-hmm. So he was using the metal detector to detect it. Have you, you ever used a metal detector? I've never used a metal detector. I've always kind of wanted to, though. Like, I think it would be kind of fun to do, but I, I'm just too embarrassed to actually like do it. I'm not going to spend the money on one either. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe because... you could find riches beyond your wildest dreams if you had a metal <laughs> detector. Get get yourself a visor. Yeah, when I go out on all my adventures, be like... Just give it to okay, your kids. Yeah. Like, all right, kid. Be like, all right, one of you is carrying the metal detector. Olivia would probably like it. She'd be like, dude, Yeah. I bet they all would actually. I bet the, the younger ones. I mean, Jarek would would like it, but he'd have to pretend not to. Totally, he's a teenager. Mm-hmm. It's part of the code. Yeah, it might it might not be that bad of an idea. I just feel like lugging it around. They it, they seem a little tenuous. To... I'll bet you they're less unwieldy these days. Probably. I'll bet you they're they're pretty lightweight. Huh. Well, anyway, this guy, he found a hammer in a pond somewhat close to the <laughs> murder scene. Did he find the ring? <laughs> they didn't say. I I honestly didn't look. I mean, no ring found, but possible evidence in a you know thirty seven year old murder, or at the time I guess thirty five year old murder. Still, yeah, yeah, um, that's a. Find. Apparently, this hammer matched the description of one that Marty told the investigators he'd lost mm-hmm. he, during his interview, which we'll get into in a little bit. He was just rambling about shit, and one of the things he talked about was a hammer and how it's like. A nice hammer, and he lost it. Uh huh. I lost my hammer. It's like, why did you even need to mention the hammer? Exactly. Marty? That's that's not suspicious at all. So it matched, and he described it down so n- enough that investigators were able to be like, "Oh, well, that's fucking Marty's hammer." Yeah, that so, looks like Marty's lost hammer. Lost with the air quotes. Yeah. And it's it's being t- t- tested for trace DNA and blood residue. But I haven't seen anything that says anything. Have you seen anything that says anything? According to an article that I read in May, they are still waiting on the results because it does take some time. There's probably quite a backlog. I know, but they found this in 2016. So it's been two years. It has been two. That's that's a long fucking time. They say it's common. That it's really common for it to take this long. I think that they would like bump this up a little bit. Well, if you're talking about a DNA comparison, like, but the what's, two, what's the two number year... one suspects are dead. So yes. it's like, what are you going to do? Throw the remains in jail? It's, I mean, yes, people want closure, people but it's do want closure. not. I would think that it would just as a departmental PR thing that you've True. Fucking solved it. It's a very, it's a well known unsolved mystery. But that's it's why the big. case has been reopened. Well, yes. Or not reopened, but, but re- renewed. Like, I would think, you know, attack, let's attack fast with more vigor. that. Well, it costs a lot of money. And it, in a small department, you probably don't have a lot of money to throw around. It's like, do you solve this murder or does Frank keep his job? 
<laughs> Old fucking Frank. Hey. He's been on the force like 30, 30 years. years. <laughs> he's just going to he's going to retire next year. He's just getting too old for this he's shit. He's just waiting for his pension to kick in. That's right. <laughs> so then he can go and retire with his wife. And then Frank's going to get like fucking like murdered like Maybe. 2 months before he retires. Work in this case. <laughs> They also found a rusty six-inch bladed knife behind the where the Cuddy store used to be, and that was also turned o- turned over to the Department of Justice for testing. Also found in 2016. Interesting. So they found another knife, huh? Yes. I did not know about that. Yes. So I knew about the fucking hammer, but ah, uh, it just ugh. it just gives me like a whole body. Heat I mean, at heat. least get an axe or a hatchet so it's Something more of like a one thing quick. just quick i mean come on do you have to be such a dick because chances are pretty good you're not going to kill someone the first blow with a hammer no or the first stab with I'm, a knife. i really hope so but i don't think that's the case oh my god so back to 1981 police interviewed everyone they could find basically uh the <laughs> neighbors all like 100 residents <laughs> yeah yeah well not quite anymore the neighbors in the cabin next door to the Sharps reported that they woke up at one thirty in the morning to the sound of muffled screams. Now, was this different neighbors than the Seabolts? Yes, this was different neighbors. Because, yeah, I'd, I'd read that they had reported the Seabolts and Sheila, who was the daughter who was staying at the, the Seabolts, who did not get killed, but is the one who discovered it. Yeah. Um, I read that they had both said that they hadn't heard anything. And that cabin was 15 feet away. I mean, you saw that you saw that video where they were visiting yeah. the site. And, oh, my God, not only it was fucking creepy. It looked like something out of the fucking ring. Totally. Yeah. It was, like, raining. Uh, and man. Northern California for you. Yeah. Except, that, except when I went there when it was, like, half on fucking fire. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. it is still pretty goddamn dry. Well, not, yeah, not but, anymore. But during the, the but spring, fall, winter, it was probably, like, winter was time. Yeah. I imagine it was winter time. It's probably, like, the one time of year it's, like, you know raining a lot but... no, i don't know i was there i've been to arcado several times and but arcado is by the coast okay that's very and, true yeah and no yeah totally. yeah Keddie is like way more east it's so their almost, weather's it's, gonna it be bore, way more it, common like reno or... nevada is only like 80 miles away oh okay so their yeah. weather's gonna be significantly different than yeah on, yeah okay All yeah right. then on the Fair coast point. yeah no i mean eureka we were there i mean everywhere else it was like a hundred plus degrees. Go to Eureka at so 75. We go to your, your, yeah, Eureka and Arcade is like fucking 75 yeah, and all yeah. like foggy. It wasn't even 75. It was like 61. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> totally, totally. You're just like, oh my God, I love this place. This is so comfortable. I know Jarek was. I actually enjoyed all the heat that I experienced. Yeah, that's Do you true. see how fucking tan I am? Yeah. When was the last time I was this tan? Like maybe my arms will get tan, but my face and my legs. It's good. Good job. Are you looking at my stems here? I'm, I'm pretty. I'm pretty stoked about it. Hell I'm yeah. pretty stoked about my badass California tan. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, that pla- 15 feet. That is how close the Seabolt's cabin was to cabin 28. And I imagine that the other neighbor's cabin was was also probably similarly close. Um, they said they heard muffled screams. They It was a couple. They got up. They looked around. They couldn't figure it out, so they went back to bed. Strange that the Seabolt's heard nothing, although maybe they had the TV on or something. Well, and that the Stranger kids that the kids never yeah, woke the up. kids never waking up is really fucking weird. I don't know. I mean, maybe I guess if you gag somebody quick enough. And overpower them. The police thought that there was two suspects, and this is something I tend to agree with because at least two, yeah. Because I mean, you got the mom, and then it's a fifteen-year-old boy and a seventeen-year-old boy, and they are going to give you some resistance for sure. Yeah, you're going to need at least two people to definitely disable them. Yep. Two two grown men on two teenage boys and one thirty-six-year-old woman. Uh, well, the police also interviewed Martin Smart. Martin Smart was the stepfather of Justin Eason. Who was one of the kids that was spending the night. It's like two friends spent the night. One ended up murdered and one did not. Yes, the younger one did not. Smart had a house guest named Joe Bo Bobaday. I'm sure they called him Bo because his last name was Bobaday. They'd met at the VA hospital where Martin was being treated for PTSD. He was in Vietnam. Smart's story was that on April 11th, he, his wife, and Bo went to the local bar, the backdoor bar it was called, for some drinks. 
Martin had worked at a cook there, but had just been fired, supposedly for being a shitty cook. Allegedly, he was selling drugs and making hash to make ends meet after he got fired. Or maybe the whole time. Probably the whole time. <laughs> you're probably the... not making that much as a cook, but no. you're making ends meet in the first place. Not if you're li- Well, you're living in a keddy cabin, so you're not making... <laughs> yeah, things ain't great. On the way to the bar, they stopped and asked Sue if she wanted to come with them, but she declined. Some say that Sue and Marty had been sleeping together. I'm not sure how much evidence of that there actually is. No, I I don't think there is because I watched this documentary on it that was like really old. It was done, I don't know, probably it was like 10 years or something. Everyone's still got like their 80s wear and hair. Oh, so like 20 years ago, you mean? Well, it was like 1981 when it happened. And yeah. the daughter was like grown up, but a young grown up. So, like, in the early 90s? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Early okay. 90s. But everyone still had, like, their 80s hair, and they were all in, like, 80s-style clothes. Still, totally. Because it was, like, early 90s. Grunge hadn't quite hit yet and really brought the nope. ripped-up pants nope. and, the, and the flannel to <laughs> California. Okay, that's fair. But talking to some of the residents there, people were just, like, I think very judgmental of Sue. Now, there's a theory that she was... So she had an abusive husband and I guess it was her that she had been kind of counseling Marilyn Smart, who was the wife of Marty and Marty might've had motive to kill her because she was poking her head in, in their marital business, so to speak. And I tend to believe that more than she was sleeping with him because I saw a lot of people that were like, yeah, I judged her and, yeah, it's, you know, I, I'd i heard all these stories about her having all these guys over. I mean, like, you're in a town of, like, so few people, and allegedly all this stuff was going on, but mostly it's just you're living in this small town full of, like, a bunch of assholes and... Drug addicts, probably. Starting rumor, people starting rumors and people being all judgy, and she was a young, pretty single mother who I'm sure was overwhelmed at the time, but I just I just don't get that vibe. I know I don't know her or anything, but I don't feel like, I don't think she was doing anything untoward. And even if she was having an affair or there was drugs in the house, that is still no fucking reason why she, you know, for her to be murdered. Oh, no, well, no, there's very few reasons but there for was just someone a lot to be murdered. Of, but... There was just a lot of victim blaming it's very yeah that's... in that in that particular in that really old doc- documentary that they that they did on it back before it, victim blaming was even a thing right exactly and it was just like well you know i just heard you know, it was it's people like in an official capacity just snidely saying that you know i heard the stories that there's just you know men in and out all the time and you know we tried to look past that and really you know <laughs> right care about her case but we sorted it in cuz it could have been just anyone apparently cuz there were just people in and out of there all the time it was yeah i just it was just very sad to see to see them saying that kind of stuff about her when i don't i didn't get a vibe that she was no for a lot of the stuff i read it there was one account of her having some sort of argument with a man outside of her house that lasted like 30 minutes of him Mm -hmm. calling her a cunt and him her calling him like a son of a bitch or something Mm but a lot of but no one never knew who it was and like yeah sometimes i mean everyone needs to have someone and so you know you make a bad decision every once in a while what the fuck like right who, who's anyone else to judge right but well, I apparently didn't... all the uh residents of fucking a lot of the residents of Ketty. <laughs> right yeah that's true okay yeah. well she didn't go to the bar with him regardless uh, once they got to the bar marty was super pissed about the music that was playing so he bitched to the manager about it he's like hey i don't like this fucking music so it wasn't neither it was neither country nor western and he was like fuck this shit about it what is this goddamn new wave probably right they probably had like the clash on or something yeah i don't know something (laughs) well they had a couple drinks they put on the cure yeah it's some depeche mode (laughs) 
Imagine the softest sheets you've ever felt. Now imagine them getting even softer over time. That's what you'll feel with Bolin Branch's best-selling signature sheets in 100% organic cotton. In a recent customer survey, 96% replied that Bolin Branch sheets get softer with every wash. Start getting your best night's sleep in sheets that get softer and softer for years to come. Try their sheets with a 30-night guarantee, plus for a limited time get 20% off your first order at bolinbranch.com code SPAN. Exclusions apply. See site for details. <laughs> Yeah, well, they had a couple of drinks, and he just could not handle the music, so they went back home. God. Like, what is wrong with this guy? Like, have you ever right? gone to a bar and be like, I can't fucking oh, I handle I can't this. handle this music. I'm out. Like, the one thing to do in town. Right, exactly. And that's how you're going to... Maybe that's why he felt like he had such entitlement over it. Like, that I'm going to leave if you play this stupid music still like hey i used to you're work. not gonna get my patronage that i used you, to work that, here motherfucker right that doesn't leaves you with like two customers for the night motherfuckers right no I probably just, a lot of customers because what else is going on but there's this not a lot of people oh i know but still and that like bar... half of them seem to be like children so <laughs> oh, <that's, yeah. laughs> so there's still like 50 people in a bar that doesn't automatic i mean they're the children okay, 49 because sue to... wasn't there yeah exactly I'm going to guarantee you he probably felt that not drinking there that night was going to like hurt their profits. <laughs> right. And maybe that was a little bit true. Maybe. <laughs> well, they went home. Marilyn watched some TV and went to bed. Marty was still super pissed about the music, so he called <laughs> back and bitched to the this... manager about the music again. Did you turn off that fucking music yet? Well, apparently he did because then he and Bo went back to the bar for drinks. Probably because they were like looking at the till and just like, damn it. Like, all right, well, they're each going to spend at least 20 bucks. Mm -hmm. We got to we got to do what Marty wants. God, I hate having to kiss that guy's ass. (laughs) I just fired him because he can't cook for shit. (laughs) So apparently this story was enough for the police to call the Sacramento Department of Justice and be like, you guys, we got some prime suspects. Dude, Department of Justice, like. I haven't heard that name in, like, so long. Like, who the fuck are they even? Who the fuck are they to come in and, like, take over the case? I imagine probably in a felony case they need to get some... Because there's some tiny little fucking town or something? or Something what? like that, maybe. I'm not 100%. I didn't actually really look into that. But I imagine that they needed to... It was just odd. I didn't look into it either, obviously, but every time I would see it, like, the DOJ... It was like, why the fuck are they even doing this? Yeah, it probably just needed someone in there that had more authority than anyone in that town. Like, maybe the town, I don't know. But wouldn't know. they call, like, the FBI? Uh, it, it seems like more of an had, FBI thing. I guess because it had to deal with children, yeah. Children possibly kidnapped, too. The FBI totally handles, like, kidnapping. Yeah, yeah. Because she, for all they know, she could have been taken over state line. They were close to yeah, the state line. they were. It wouldn't have been hard. It would not have been. So I'm just I'm just curious, like, what, what the deal was with that. So... You know, maybe somebody else would like to to look that up and let us know. Stranger Than Podcast at gmail dot com. The DOJ sent down Harry Bradley and P. A. Krim to interview the suspects again. P. P. A. Krim. What the fuck does Krim. that even mean? That P- sounds like something in like a British show. I know it's super weird. I don't know why. It is so fucking. Who weird. Who goes like, by initials? I mean, really. It sounds like. The last name sounds like it should be in England and like PA sounds like it should be for, you know, the way that they have different names for their cops out there. Yeah. 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 Like DI, like DI Banks. Like I would love if I was a cop, I wouldn't want to just be a detective. I want to be like detective inspector. I want to be detective inspector. Well, go be a cop in London. That sounds fucking awesome. (laughs) But yeah, PA Krim. Strange thing about Bradley and Krim. (laughs) <laughs> they were from the organized crime unit. Interesting. Interesting. They're just like, well, we just didn't have anything else to do. Well, Bo did so have we connections. So we'd like come in and take a look at this case. Bo did have known connections with Chicago organized crime. It doesn't surprise me a whole lot because that guy was... A shady motherfucker. Totally yeah. fucking shady. Just shade all over that guy. Well, he had fancy mob names. His Some of his... Uh, Mob names were John DeSantis and Bobby Lake. Bobby Lake. That's like a porn star name. It is kind of. (laughs) I think Richard Lake would be a better porn star. Dick Lake? Exactly. Yes. That's an excellent porn star name. 
If you ever do porn, you got to adopt that name, okay? <laughs> yeah, because there's <laughs> – that's going to be happening pretty soon. Oh the porn career is taking off. You know, it upsets me. Not so much porn, but stripping. Like, that was always like – I've never been a stripper, but – Exotic was... dancer, please. <laughs> <laughs> right sorry i'm just saying i never actually pursued it as a career but it was always like a potential backup like oh yeah you never know maybe i get fired and i can't find another job and shake that booty to pay the rent right and i'm just like fuck it i'll be a stripper i really hate that that door is quickly closing for me like oh, no. i am getting too old to be a stripper you and that think really you are upsets me but that that's that can't not be the, the backup case. plan anymore like that's always been the backup plan like all of my adult life and now it's like oh my god one of these days i'm gonna lose my looks i'm gonna be too old and being a stripper is no longer an option as a backup and that that upsets me i've never been one to frequent strip clubs i have been to them here and there but i've never been like an aficionado if you will Mm -hmm. I did have a friend when my early 20s and she was a stripper. Mm -hmm. And so she, me and my friend who she was dating would go and pick her up from the strip club at night. And let me tell you, Joanna, some of the women that were dancing in there were, I would not have expected them to have been able to make any money dancing, but apparently they did because that was their job. So I think you have a lot of time <laughs> and also guys are filthy bastards and there's they always have you know their it is nice their kink for dim, something dim so lights i'm still i can still clean up well under like dimmer lighting it's just now like the harsh fluorescence there's just no getting around looking my age under those no lights. one likes harsh fluorescence fluorescence <laughs> no one likes harsh fluorescence and you can't even just grow a beard mm -mm, i cannot I'm kind of glad of that, though. I'm, <laughs> yeah, it I'm would, glad that I don't have a beard. a beard actively growing that <laughs> yes. I have to try and deal with. That would be that would be some shit. Having hair on my legs is bad enough. Marilyn was also interviewed by the DOJ. Her story was very similar to that of her husband's, uh, except she included the fact that they had split that morning. The, mor the morning the murders were discovered, they'd split. Hmm. And it was because he was a violent, ill-tempered, abusive shitbag. And... It's only the day after the murders that it finally, like, crosses the line. That seems a little odd because if he was a violent, abusive shitbag, why did you wait until the day after the murders? It seems, it seems like maybe something happened to, like, maybe elevate his status as a violent douchebag in her eyes enough to where she's like, yeah, you know what? This is over. That's possible, but also sometimes it just takes time. A lot, that's why we, these people will go back to right. their abusers and back to their abusers and back to their abusers. And it happens all the fucking time before finally like, oh, my God, I've well, had enough. Yeah, I mean, anyone and who leaves an abusive to... relationship does have that moment of clarity and that point where they decide enough is enough and I'm done. But I just think the timing of it is odd but since Marty here is a big suspect. I mean... Maybe yeah. she doesn't know, but she knows. Right. She's and she's like, you know what? Yeah, we need to like not be together anymore. That's my take on it a little bit. It could bit, well be. She it was could scared. well be. Like, she's she, the only one that knows. She's still alive, I yeah. believe. And I don't know. That's just, that's just kind of how I read the situation is that she either knew or she thought she knew. She thought she knew enough to where. At least, yeah, yeah. Well, the investigators also had Marty do a polygraph test and decided that Bo, Martin, and Marilyn had nothing to do with the murders. And they, that was it. That was it. So I'm. Um, now, in a later interview. I didn't find anything that said they actually passed it, though. Just that they had them and then they stopped the investigation. Yes. Which seems a little odd. Usually that's yeah. something you mention that, oh, yeah, they all passed their polygraph. And at that point, the investigation focused elsewhere. But no, it's like they had them. And then it was just all kind of dropped a little bit. Well, they interviewed Marilyn later. And she said that Marty hated John Sharp, the 15-year-old boy. He loathed this 15-year-old boy. And why did he hate the kid? I, did, un, un, I don't know. Because I read that he hated the, hated the kid too, but I thought maybe unclear. No, I didn't. I didn't find out, out why. Because he's a crazy person, right? Um, she also says that she saw Martin burning something in the fireplace the morning of April twelfth. 
Yeah, and that didn't prompt morning. her yeah, at so. all. Like, oh, you're burning bloody clothes. Look at that. I think we need to split up. Uh, <laughs> a few things about old Marty. According to a statement his aunt made to the Plumas County Sheriff's Office, one time he was visiting his father in Phoenix, and they got into an argument. The argument ended with Marty heading out and buying a bunch of bomb fixins so he could blow up his father's house. Oh, okay. I don't think he did blow up his father's house, but he, he at least had the intention of doing so and bought the materials to make it happen. Oh, so he got all the bomb equipment together. It was 1981. It was a simpler time. <laughs> bunch of fertilizer and well, a couple of sticks of TNT and you're in Arizona. No problem. And, you know, clearly he still stuck, stuck to the simple routine because... It's like, oh, let's just use these knives around the house and this fucking hammer. A couple of hammers and knives. That's all we need to kill somebody. Allegedly. 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 Supposedly. His aunt also alleges that Marty practiced hatchet throwing and kept trying to get guns, but was unable to. In Arizona. <laughs> in 1980, in the 1980s or, or late 70s. Like, what in the fucking shit? How could you not get a gun in Arizona in the late 70s, early 80s? Well... I'm guessing there was something preventing him from legally purchasing one. Like I something don't on his know. Record, um, because it does seem like kind of unlikely. Maybe he just never had enough money for one gun. Maybe that's what it was. He was like, oh, 50 cents short. And that's a lot of money right. in the it's 80s. It's like, I can get like a new hammer for like 12 bucks. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> he was also apparently reading the Bible quite a bit and was getting super judgy on other people's moral oh my positions. God, I fucking hate it when pieces of shit read the Bible and get super into it and then start judging everyone else. Right. That is like the most annoying thing ever. People who, you know, read the Bible and are just generally decent human beings. I'm not trying to judge that, but when it's just some total piece of shit that has suddenly decided like, Oh, I'm just going to use the free Jesus ticket here to excuse everything I ever fucking did and judge others. I fucking hate that the shit out of that shit right especially when he also allegedly cheated on his wife and adultery is like a thing that jesus was not overly cool with right i think murder is also a thing that jesus is not, not really overly cool, cool with. with he's more of like a turn the other cheek Maybe like, like drink some wine kind of dude bible studies at, at that point yeah <laughs> another thing Mar marilyn said was that marty had tried allegedly marty had tried to run her and one of her sons over in a car once Oh, okay, and yeah, he, also something Jesus would not do. He didn't say specifically don't run up over people in cars, but mainly there weren't, because there weren't any cars back right. in, in the Jesus days. Right, when you pose the whole, like, what would Jesus do, the answer is not run people over with cars. He may flip a table. <laughs> well, Jesus could get a little angry. He could get a little passionate. Hey. But I'm pretty sure he would have not run over people in cars. Probably not. I think he would have found that uncool behavior. Yes, I agree. Uh, Marty also allegedly once pulled a knife on Marilyn. Oh, okay. So that's also... Like, that's also, yeah. Another mm -hmm. another thing. Another thing. Good though. old Marty. So Justin Eason. Little Justin Eason. 12 years 12 -year -old old. 12-year-old Justin Eason. I... Okay, so we're going to talk about how he... We're going to talk about him. Yeah, we're going to talk about him and the fact that his story changed a few times about what he saw yeah i mean he was forth. he was new to ketty right he and showed I, up i believe like a few months before in like late 79 he showed up mm -hmm. uh, he just moved in I, as i said previously he was living with his uh father in montana well he moved in with his mom and stepfather in november of 1980 actually so originally he told the authorities he was asleep the whole time and he hadn't heard a thing just didn't see a thing didn't hear anything but then it was like he had a dream. Yes. He said that the night the murders took place, he had a dream. He was on a boat, and he saw John and Dana fighting a man armed with a hammer. This man had long black hair, a mustache, and black glasses. So I think sunglasses mm -hmm. is what he meant by black glasses. Uh, didn't he say, like, dark glasses? Dark or black, yeah. yeah. So I imagine it's some kind of sunglasses. He wears his sunglasses at night. It was 1981. What mm -hmm. do you want? This guy tossed John out of the boat. And then a very drunk Dana got tossed out of the boat shortly thereafter. On the bow of the ship, he saw a sheet covering a body. So he looked under the sheet and saw Sue with a knife wound in her chest. He tried to patch her up using a rag, but that didn't work, so he tossed the rag in the water. In another interview, 
this one he was being poly- polygraphed. And he told the polygrapher, polygrapher? I guess. I don't know. Yeah. He told the guy running the polygraph machine that he may have seen the murders. He says that a loud noise woke him, and he looked through the door into the room the bodies were found in and saw Sue lying on the couch and two men standing around her, one with long black hair and dark glasses, another with brown hair and army boots. Now, did these descriptions match his father and the dad's friend, Marty and Bo? The pictures I saw of them showed them both to have beards. Uh Uh-huh. But, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he made that description up. Maybe. Because I think if he did some see something, that was his fucking stepdad. He was new. I mean, maybe he didn't know his stepdad that that well. Maybe he thought he was a piece of shit. Maybe he wanted to go live with his real dad Still, in Montana. if you're fucking 12 years old and you think your stepdad's a piece of shit and you've been living there a few months and see him being abusive and mean... I'm sorry. It's still, I would be fucking terrified as shit if I was that kid. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that's. And maybe he couldn't keep it to himself that he'd seen something, but then he had to give like a different description. Because maybe, maybe. He that's... just, he was way too scared to be like, oh, yeah, it was my fucking stepdad. <laughs> it is possible. However, I mean, him and his mom, or his mom split, his biological mother split from him the day of the murder, the day after the murders. So. Chances are pretty good he was going to go live with her someplace, and in this next interview, he was already someplace else. Right. I don't. I, I mean, still, that's just speculation. I, don't know. I mean, but it's that's what I'm. I mean, that seems logical to me. I just don't know what I would do though if I saw somebody who was that close to me, like relation wise. Even if he didn't like him, you know, he was his stepdad. I would be terrified. I would be terrified to like wake up in the middle of the night and see him and the guy that he's not only him, but the guy I would be afraid of that. Yes. But I don't think I would be afraid of that. If the guy was no longer in my life, if my mother and him were now split and we were in two different places, I, I don't know, but I don't know because guess what? I've never been in that fucking position. Right. I'm so it's really saying, hard. I mean, like, this is I pure speculation. Like, it's very possible. You're right. I mean, I feel like he could have been that he too terrified two people that didn't maybe fit the description of his dad and, and Bo, I think that was done out of fear. Probably. It's it's possible. It's all, but he's also 12 and mm-hmm. eyewitness accounts are notoriously bad. Right. So, and you're terrified. I mean, maybe I mean, he you're, doesn't you, need, you could be I right. Just, I don't know. Only he knows. Yes. Only he knows, but I think whatever he knows, and he may not know gonna, because he may, I mean, he just may be, have been just, so disturbed by this mm-hmm. whole thing. Yeah. Uh, so John and Dana entered the room. John, uh, John's bedroom was kind of downstairs in the basement. I guess it had, the only way to get to it was from outside. Right. Which and is weird because the boys were down in the basement. No, the boys were in the because other room. In the other room because they pulled them from the house. Yes. Out the window. Right. But I don't think they did it like from the upper level. I don't think the boys were in the basement. I thought the boys were because in the, the boys are in a room that is a, that he, where you can open the door and see the living room where the murders took place. And if he lives in the basement, that's not. A room that's adjacent to the living room. Wouldn't it be though? Because you had to go downstairs. Well, I think it's only. I believe it was only accessible from outside. Hmm. At any rate, a basement Whatever. is below a. Li- yeah. I mean, the living. It's the basement. It's, mm-hmm. It was. It wasn't really supposed to be a room, but. Right. It was an unfinished basement. Yeah. In like a shitty, dilapidated cabin. So it I certainly wasn't <laughs> next to the living room in any way. Where. Which was probably also dilapidated. And well, that's probably not. It's a fucking That's, cabin. Yeah. It was like meant to be like a cabin, a yeah. cabin. At any rate, Dana and John enter the room and they start arguing with these two men. This led to a fight. Dana tries to escape, but gets smacked with a hammer by the brown haired man. The black haired man is attacking John and Sue is trying to help John. At this point, this kid is hiding behind the door and watching all this shit goes down. So he sees... I mean, everything that happened. He sees the men tie up the boys. He also watches Tina walk into the room with a blanket, asking what's going on. Allegedly, the two men grabbed her and took her out the back door. God. The black-haired man was also witnessed by the boy cutting the middle of Sue's chest with a pocket knife. They did have a sketch artist work with Justin to come up with the composites of the suspects. Mm -hmm. But again, I didn't see a resemblance. But they weren't, I mean, they're just composites. They're not, they weren't great. Right. Where's Tina? 
Where's Tina? That just that bothers me so much because I don't even want to think about what Tina went through before she died. Because why? Why would you? Why would you take her from the house? You're gonna like murder everybody that was a witness, with the exception of the three boys. Why but wouldn't you, you just do it there? Why wouldn't you just do it there, right then and there? Why like would you, you just take a twelve-year-old girl with you? Mm-hmm. I hope they just killed her. I don't think they did, though. I think they they had other reasons for taking her along with them. With yeah, I hope not. I because truly hope not. Why? Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just kill her right away? They maybe, wanted, they wanted to keep her alive for something. Maybe they got paranoid because they just killed through three people and needed to get the fuck out of Dodge and so they just grabbed her as a witness along the way and just uh, a, a moment of panic. Right, and then just finished her off later. Yes. Well, let's hope so. I mean, we can't, I we can't so. tell if no. she was sexually assaulted because she, her remains were skeletonized yes. and by in, the time she was found. They did find them at her, some of her in 1984. They found skull fragments. They were found about 30 miles away in a place called Camp 18, California. Hmm. From what I know about Camp 18 is that one of the investigators, one of the current day investigators that have gone out there a couple times has gotten lost literally every time he's gone out there. Jeez. Like, couldn't, can't find it at first and then stumbles upon it. So it's deep in the middle of nowhere. Man. And it's so weird that on the third anniversary, they get the phone call about the skull. Yes. An now, anonymous first phone off, call. First off, they find, I mean, the authorities scour the area. And they find a jawbone, other bits of bones. This was in addition to the skull bone that was found by like a hunter. I guess it was like mm-hmm. some kind of hunting place, uh, like a camp area, something like that. It was deep enough that hunters were the only people out there. Which just makes it awful for some reason. I don't know. Now, they didn't find the tape with the anonymous call until 2013. Yeah, because it had just been sealed up. It was in a sealed envelope in the bottom of the the box of of evidence. Of evidence, yeah. Like, why? The call was anonymous, and it just said, "Oh, hey, did you think maybe those remains were of Tina Sharp or something to that effect?" And then they hung up. Uh, They've been doing tests on the the tape, like. Audio test. Audio test. Make it like comparing Audio the voice comparison. to other okay. other other voice uh, recordings they have of the suspects to see if it matches anyone. But still, nothing on that either. Apparently, like, that takes a long so time to do long? too. I'd really like to know. Like, I'm I'm pretty. I'm pretty. My I, I say it was Marty and Bo. That is my guess because then there's also the note. So speaking of things that were found in the evidence box in yeah, 2013, the note. there was like the little confession note that he wrote to his fucking wife about it. And it was, yeah, he wrote it to his wife who says that she never remembered receiving it. She never it. remembered receiving it, but it was in an evidence box. So someone received it. Someone received it. Someone put it in the fucking evidence box, but nobody did people actually read this fucking note. Well, the <laughs> part that says. matters in the note, it says, I've paid the price of your love, and now that I've bought it with four people's lives, you you tell me we're through? Great. What else do you want? Great. What else do you want from me? <laughs> she did confirm that the writing was Marty's, though. Yeah, but, yeah. All, allegedly, also, there was... That, he... is, that is pretty close to a confession. Allegedly, he confessed to the murders to a therapist in Reno. Yes. Now, that is fucking weird, and... What's weird is that the therapist reported it deep... Is that Okay. I mean, this I was 1981. I'm pretty sure when it's a crime, they are they actually have to report it. I'm not 100 percent sure, unless I thought it was just if they know that somebody is going to be harmed. No, I'm like pretty they sure have knowledge if, of something that is going to happen. I'm pretty sure if someone admits that. a felony to a psychiatrist, but they then have to tell or a they, therapist. Is, this is a therapist too. It a, is therapist a therapist is different than a like, psychiatrist. Yeah, not an MD. So maybe it's a little bit different. But I feel like. I mean, I'm, I guess it's not the same as attorney-client privilege. You can tell your lawyer you fucking killed people. Oh, yeah. They can't do anything about that's, that. That's, yeah, but that's... But doctor-patient confidentiality is also pretty deep, especially when it comes to mental health Yeah, therapies. but I, I'm pretty sure if you admit to a murder, they have to tell. I'm not 100%. If anyone knows and wants to tell us, strangerthanpodcast at gmail.com. <laughs> but so, the therapist anyways, was yeah. shocked that they didn't he tells use the this police, information. And then they... Don't do anything about it. They, I couldn't find the therapist's name. Yeah. 
I never all all I it was a therapist in Reno. Was yes, all the information I could get on that. Me too. Uh, Marty Smart died in two thousand six, I believe, of prostate cancer or something. Well, fucking good. I'm not very sad that he's dead. In two thousand thirteen, Sheriff Hegwood had been the boss for three years. He was actually childhood friends with Dana and John back in the day. Mm -hmm. They took martial arts classes together, and Hegwood had actually spent time in that cabin. Well, yeah, because there's only like 50 fucking people in that town. So if anyone was like the same age, you were like friends. Exactly. You had like your little friend posse because those were like the only other kids around. There wasn't friends to choose from where you have like separate cliques. Nope. It's like, no. You're only the like, you're like you're there's with like these four kids people my age that's it. and that's yep. it. Well, he got a PI to take over the investigation because it needed to have he didn't have the funds and so he could give a PI some money and and you know not tie up police funds. The PI named Gamberg because what's his name's got to get his pension, you know. Frank. Frank. The PI named Gamberg had been a martial arts instructor that taught both Dana and John. I'm I'm assuming also Hagwood. When they get into the evidence boxes, it was just a clusterfuck. Shit was out of order. Information was missing. They found there was the... like glaring information and evidence that apparently nobody had like looked at or fucking right, investigated. Right, right. Such as the letter. It's like and the tape. It's like okay, guys, all the important stuff goes in this box, and then we're just gonna like put it away. Yes, that thing. That's how this is gonna happen. Well, this is when it comes to light that the Department of Justice inv- investigators were not really on their game on this case. It seems not. <laughs> Bo's story contradicted... Like glaringly so. Bo's story contradicted a ton of shit that both Marilyn and Marty said. They had completely different stories. He said he'd been a cop in Chicago for 18 years. Right, he was like full of fucking lies. They he was didn't like telling... check it. They didn't fact check shit. Because you know how easy it would be to find out if he was a cop in Chicago? Dude. One phone call, I'm sure. Right. Maybe two. Right. Even back in like 1981, like... This is still like it's probably easier than today. Another because, thing, you know, is that probably not easier, but still well, pretty so easy. It's like there's just less. All you do is go on the internet nowadays, right? I'm sure inter interdepartmental like database or something. Mm-hmm. Another thing is that Marty during his interview said something about his stepson possibly seeing something and added, "Without me detecting him." So, like, what in the fucking fuck is that supposed to mean? Well, literally, it means that the kid saw something and I didn't notice he was there. I don't really think that's what he actually said because Marty doesn't seem like the kind of fellow to say, "Oh, the child did not detect me." Well, I don't know. He's kind of like, "Oh, I lost my hammer." Right, but just <laughs> the way that it's worded, he didn't see me, but he didn't detect me. He doesn't yeah. seem like the kind of fella to use a 50 cent word like detect. That's true. That's true. Regardless, the DOJ agents didn't did catch on. They didn't ask him to elaborate. Nothing. They're just like, oh, okay. It's like they've got their little like notebook. They're writing down just like, oh, okay. That will that. They're just drawing that pictures. That solves that. Yeah. They're like the cops from <laughs> they're Superbad. They're like drawing like, yeah, they're drawing like stick figures and shit and drawing pictures of fucking dicks or something who the fuck knows obviously not doing their fucking job right and both after they were you know i mean this just this is so glaring to me kind of like who the people that are probably guilty are after the doj basically cleared the guys they were like oh it's not these guys they both left yeah they both split town yep because Basically, they were like, oh, my God, they were stupid enough to buy it. Let's get the fuck out of here before somebody smart comes and figures it out. Yeah, Bo died in 1988. He went back to Chicago. Apparently, he scammed some cops out of money and then died before he could get indicted or before he could go to prison for it. Oh, interesting. So was it like a mysterious death or like? No, it was it was just acts. it was a medical death. It was a medical. Yeah, he was death. older. Allegedly, he was he was 20 or 30 <laughs> years older than Marty. Mm-hmm. So Marty was in like his uh, 40s or something, and this guy was in his 60s. So he was a little bit older. So, I mean, really, he could have had a heart attack, could I have guess. been a stroke. I guess. Interesting, though, that he was in legal trouble again. Yeah, like, well, he shocker. was a fucking dickbag, mm-hmm. allegedly. No, I think he was definitely a oh, dick he was definitely bag. A dick There's bag, no allegedly yeah. about the dickbag no, part. Right, right. He just allegedly was a murderer of a whole fucking family. Well, Cabin 28 was demolished in 2004. 
Yeah. There were some other buildings in the area that were condemned, so they got knocked down as well. It's alleged that some people in town had seen ghosts and had seen writing on the walls, like literal writing on the walls and like furniture moving on its own inside the cabin. Which just sounds to me, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say it's not haunted, but my take on that is it's just a really fucking freaky place to be in the middle of the fucking woods, oh, in the middle yeah. of fucking nowhere. And it's yeah. really easy for your mind to play tricks with you when you're under that level of stress and fear. And I know we have a lot of people that Because I would be freaking out if like an entire family, like 15 feet away from where I fucking live was like murdered in the night and there's nobody in jail for it. There's no suspects. It could be anybody as far as you're concerned. And when you're out in an area like that. And it's in this it remote is fucking area. Dark. It is dark as fuck. Like, like, like that windy fucking road oh, to yeah. red. I mean, it was so dark and there is like nothing. No and street lights, maybe no mileage light wise it's not a huge way from things, but the the way to get it takes hours. Because it, it takes the, like a fucking hour to drive like twenty miles. As the crow flies, it ain't no thing, but the 20 miles is about 60 because of the wines. Yes, yeah. exactly. It'll take you at least an hour to go like 20 miles in a place like that, usually. Well, according to a psychic, Annette Martin, she advises police all over America on murder cases. The ghosts of the victims will remain at the location the house stood because they are likely in shock and possibly unaware they died. Mm, it's like one of those like situations, like ghost situations, literally. Yeah. Remember the movie Ghost? He was like in shock. He didn't go into the light. Yeah. Poltergeist, another yep. thing. Yep. Although that doesn't make as much sense because it seems like they were in the light when they were buried in the cemetery, but it was once the house was on the cemetery. Maybe they just stay to the cemetery if they're buried in one. And that's why if you build a house over like the coffins that they haunt your house. Yeah. Because they would just be doing it anyways. Stuck except to like, the area. fuck, there's a fucking house over me now. Like, what the fuck? I guess I'm just going to like fuck with shit in the house now. Just because they're of just walking floating around, around yeah. the confines of the cemetery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just floating around, being like Casper like and shit. Knocking stuff over because you can't see. Right. You think you're going about your daily life and there's right. suddenly this shit there and whatever. You don't notice. You're, you're a ghost. Right, exactly. Hm. Well, I'm pretty much with you, Joanna. I'm, I think that from what I've read, that Marty and Bo were the guys that killed them, killed the Sharps. Mm hmm. I think that. If it's right and he just, Marty hated John, that was just another reason. Right. Even if he wasn't sleeping with a Sue, just, which he probably wasn't, but it's possible. It's possible. And it's also possible that he was just truly pissed off. He was just a fucking piece of shit and he didn't like her getting involved. And I mean, and the fact that they took the girl too. I mean, has anyone ever thought that maybe some of that centered around kidnapping her? Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, but I didn't really see. I mean, a lot what are they going to get ransom? Putting that out there, no. But why do why do a lot of people kidnap children? I guess for you know slavery, to fucking rape. No, to fucking rape them and murder them. Well, there's also that there's also that. What happens? But then why didn't they take the boys? Because they didn't want to rape and murder the boys, and one of them was his own stepson. I think it's weird that he even like went into the place when he knew his fucking stepson was there. Or maybe one of maybe Marty had. Well, maybe he thought that that would maybe eliminate him, even though he doesn't kill him, and that stands out. Just maybe, the fact, yeah. Maybe they wouldn't even, like, dream that he was going to go in and murder a bunch of people where his fucking kid's sleeping. Oh, another thing about his supposed uh, uh, confession is that he, I guess, only confessed to killing Sue. Yeah, well, and that's what I was about to say. Like, maybe he had the motive to kill Sue, but then Bo comes in and starts acting all fucking psycho. Or maybe the kids, or maybe they didn't know that uh, John and Dana were there. Because they were out and supposed to be coming back later in the night. Maybe I, they surprised them. Yeah, I read that they, they had been out in Quincy and they hitchhiked back. So it's possible that they just showed up at the wrong time. And it's like, why don't you just come up and fucking, like, hit her in the night if she's sleeping and stuff? Like, why do you stuff her panties in her... Why do you remove her panties and put her... Well, if what Justin said is correct, and they were standing around talking shit to the mom, maybe he was just being trying to be a dick to her, trying to like obviously. You know, pu- well, I mean, he killed her, so yeah, but or allegedly killed but her. That, but that I mean, like puffing of his chest, like bitch, elements, why are you talking to my fucking wife about this shit or whatever? You know, it puts a sexual element to the crime. It does, and so then it's not so far fetched to think that maybe it wasn't planned that way. But I bet it was. I bet it was like Bo's idea. Like, let's take the girl. You know, like maybe, ugh. maybe. 
I don't know. I just, I feel like it was more sexually motivated, maybe for one of them, maybe for Marty, it was more anger. And then for Bo, he went along with it because he kind of thought he could get his rocks off in some yeah. sick fucking way too. Maybe, like, maybe. why do you go in on murder with somebody if you're not going to get any money or anything like that? Obviously robbery is not the fucking motive. No, clearly not. There's yeah. nothing. They've got nothing. They've got nothing. Monetarily speaking. Poor as shit. So yeah. what's the motivate? What's his end on it? What's his motivation to go in there and kill fucking three people, four people actually. Maybe he just likes to kill. Yeah, and likes to, like, rape and kill, too. I, try, I tried to find some information on him, and I could find very little information on him. Right. Just that the fact he's dead and that, you know, he was implicated in all of this and the little bit about him possibly and being— And if he was—if he did play his part, I'm fucking glad as shit that he's dead. He deserves to be dead. Yeah, they're too. both dead. And it would be interesting to see when, you know, as, as things progress, whether or not— they ever get the DNA evidence? I know, that or would if it be comes up as really conclusive, because freaking because it's so old. Oh yeah, well, there's the picture of the hammer, and it's covered in rust. Oh and yeah, so, because I don't it was know, in a fucking lake for, for God's sake for, for years, decades. 1981 to 2016. I gotta say that was probably a really well made hammer, though. Yes, yeah. I guess I guess met I guess steel and metal it just doesn't. It takes a long time. It for takes that a to long break time down. for that, especially to the break bottom of a lake water. or a pond or whatever it was. It's not even salt water. Because it's, it's not salt water. water. Additionally, there's not a lot of movement in the water. True, not so, a lot of friction. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it'll be interesting too. But yeah, I would definitely, I would definitely, definitely put this as Marty and Bo. I believe it was. And them. then, what do you think about like the DOJ? Do you think there was some kind of weird cover up, or do you think they're just fucking stupid? I I lean towards you stupid. know. I feel like they are from the big city of Sacramento, and they're getting tossed down to this shit town of Ketty with 100 people or whatever. And maybe they're just not taking it seriously. Maybe they don't give a fuck. I think clearly they maybe they are take on the take with the Chicago mob. Give a fuck. That's possible too. Yeah, but like, I think why it's does the Chicago likely that? Why does the Chicago mob have Department of Justice agents in Sacramento, California? L.A.? Sure, I can see that. But Sacramento? Right. Like, I mean, no offense to anyone living in Sacramento, but what the what's the point in that? It's actually a very nice city. It's, it's a right great city. Of it. But, I mean, like, is there... I dated a girl from there once, actually. Uh, yeah. But uh, there's no... It's not like a main hub of mob activity, oh, I'm yeah, sure. no. So it seems it seems weird they'd be on the take. I think they just didn't take it seriously, didn't care. They're like, this is an organized crime. Kind of dumb. I heard, too, that the sheriff of that town, Sheriff Thomas, I believe, uh, might have been friends with Marty. He claimed that he had given the marriage counseling. Maybe. And just on one occasion where he advised, they sought advice for their marital problems. And... So he was trying to kind of like say like, no, I wasn't his friend. They sought me out for some marital advice before the murders, but that's it. But other people said that they were kind of pals. So I mean, it could be that it was a little bit of both, but not really intentionally just like, oh, no, it's not Marty, you know, DOJ guys. Well, like I can't I'm sheriff even, around here. I know. I, know I can't even see about. the DOJ giving a shit about some small time, sh- yeah. small town sheriff. It just it all seems I would I would say incompetence more than a conspiracy. It just doesn't seem like and and what's it just seems like who's to gain from all the conspiring? Right. I mean, well, it's like Marty doesn't get to go to jail. Bo doesn't I have think, to go to jail. But I mean, they're both sort of Bo's, inconsequential Bo's people. I guess for I don't going know. in on it wasn't about murdering or teaching. You know, Sue a lesson. It was about either raping her or raping one of her daughters. Something. Something. I mean, I feel bad for the family. It It sucks. I think that's on Bo's end. And I, yeah, I don't don't think it was drugs. I don't think it was because Sue had a lot of guys in and out of there. Like, I don't, I don't think any of that had anything to do with it. And even if it did, like I said, that's no, that's not a reason for murder. That's not a reason for murder at all, or yeah. it doesn't imply that she deserved any of it in any way, shape, or form. Oh, no so. way. But, yeah, I don't think any of that was going on. I think it was straight. You know, one guy was pissed that he that she was meddling in his marriage, and the other guy was a fucking piece of shit. Just along probably for the ride. Come, come yeah. along for the ride, so yeah. to speak. They are wasted and decided, hey, let's fucking do some shit. Yeah. But who knows? Who knows? And I think the boys came home. The boys came home, or, or they were just in the basement. Or, and maybe the basement's like if it's an 
like underground basement, then it's probably pretty soundproof down there. Who knows? And so maybe they just I mean, came up to get go to like I don't know blood something. everywhere. I mean, it was just yeah. just so fucked up. And that's another thing they didn't really. I don't think they did a very good job, like forensics wise. And it was also 1981, right? But but you're right. They still botched it from mm-hmm. what I read. I mean, yeah. And then also just the like, oh, we give them a polygraph. Do we know what the result is? No, but it was just like, oh, it's not these guys, even though it seems like, you know. That would be a lot of paperwork if it was these guys. Right. And it was just like, what the fuck? Because there just seemed to be a compelling amount of evidence that that was exactly the case. Yeah. Anyways. I mean, the local cops certainly thought it was was those two guys enough that they called the DOJ down. I hope that they do get it solved because there are still living victims. Sheila was a victim. Yes. Definitely. Greg was a victim. Ricky yes. was a victim. Yes. 100%. They were all victims. Uh, you know, had and they their deserve sister closure. sister and brother and mother murdered. Uh, and they Justin deserved, was a victim. Yeah, Justin was a victim too. And it's like they deserve to know what happened 100%, to their family. 100%. So I hope that they do get some resolution on that soon for their sake. I hope the goddamn DNA tests come through. And, mm-hmm. and I hope they prove that it was either Marty or Bo or both. Or, or it just proves that someone... Just someone. I hope whatever something. whatever the result is, is that it gives them some kind of closure. It's not bringing anybody it. back, but that's not but what, what's... At least you're going to have it. You're just going to know to know. Exactly. It's fucking it's, awful, it's, but... It's closure. It's, it's good yeah, to have. It's closure. It's, it's, yeah. Well, that's about all I have here for that's the... That's about all I have here uh, as well. Well, then... Uh, Stay tuned for an ad from some really cool gals that we've been listening to. Yes, it'll be, it'll be fantastic. You should check them out, the Golden Ghouls. <laughs> and awesome uh, name right there. That's right. <laughs> and we will talk to you next time. And stay strange. Hey, ghouls and guys, do you like to get spooky and stay spooky? Then check out our podcast, The Golden Ghouls. Each week, we talk about our favorite things: ghosts and the paranormal. Sound like a good time? Then give us a listen on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Goodbye. Do you enjoy the Stranger Than podcast? Please let us know. Rate and comment on iTunes. Check out and like our Facebook page, facebook.com slash stranger than podcast. Our Twitter at underscore stranger than or drop us an email, strangerthanpodcast at gmail.com. That's strangerthanpodcast, all one word, at gmail.com. Also, feel free to email us any strange, mysterious, or misunderstood stories or topic suggestions that you'd like to share or hear about.